So there's these questions we all ask, big questions that have a huge effect on our lives. But there's all this information out there that makes finding a solution difficult. So we came up with a better way to give you the answers that you need. We did a survey at Easter and compiled a list of your top six most asked questions. That list then became a roadmap for this message series. Each week, we'll examine a single question and discover God's answers based on His Word. It's a series we like to call, You Asked For It. Hi, good afternoon. (laughs) It's great to be with you guys, and welcome to those online watching. We're glad that you are tuned in also. Well, today we are beginning a new uh, series, right? And our series is uh, Questions That You Ask. So hopefully we'll get to them and we'll do a good job at that. And if we don't get to your question or your uh, topic you wanted, uh, just hold on, because it's going to be an annual thing. So it'll come up, right? We'll, we'll cycle back around to it. Now, I have the uh, privilege of, of talking to you today about um, how do you reach the next generation, right? <clears throat> we had a lot of questions about uh, the generation to come. How do you connect with them? How do you how do you talk to him? Stuff like that. So today I'm going to uh, title my message, how to, you know, what I'd say to a young leader. Okay? So that's what we're going to look at. Now it is my custom to always ask the Holy Spirit, which is God's presence, to come and to be with us. So if you bow your heads, I'm going to do that right now. Okay? Yes, Lord. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you're present in this room right now. I acknowledge you here. And so I ask, Father, that you would move upon your people, those that you've asked to come, those you've asked to watch, Lord, and that you would speak that word that their heart needs, Lord. I could speak a thousand words, but one spoken by you, Father, can make all the difference in the world. And so, Holy Spirit, just come and move amongst us. Come and and call us to a different place. I felt you, Father. I felt you from this morning all the way through. And so, Holy Spirit, just come and descend upon us and have your way with this message. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Now, you guys, you find yourself in a church that is multi-generational, okay? And that was by design. That is what we wanted to be. That's what we feel like God has called us to be. And we take that lead from scriptures like this one in Psalm 71 that says, Since my youth, God, you have taught me, and it, to this day I declare your marvelous deeds, even when I am old and gray. I like that. Do not forsake me, my God, till I declare, watch this, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. And so... We know that God has ordained for us. Part of our journey in life is to be able to take the baton that he's given us and give it to the next generation, right? So uh, I want to start this conversation off by talking about uh, generations because I believe it's in the eyes of the beholder, really. I mean, I could go and I could have put up a fancy chart of what the different generations are, but really uh, it is in the eye of the beholder. For example, my mom, who's 86, still calls me a young kid, <laughs> right? You're a young girl, uh, and I'm, I'm 61, right? And so it really is your perception. It's, it's where you're coming from when you look. So whether you're older generation or you're younger generation, you'll have to decide that for your own self. But I will say this. There is this passing of information, this passing of what God has done in your life, the power of Christ, that we are wanting you to be a part of. You see, every generation interprets stuff out of their generation, right? And so we might, they might have um, different ideas and thoughts than we do. They're going to look at different topics such as health care or, or um, <laughs> legalizing marijuana, right? Or uh, the environment. And they're going to make assumptions and values and stuff and that you might not agree with. And so when I'm talking about passing on to the next generation, I'm not talking about having uniformity on these topics, Not at all. Rather, I'm talking about the power of Christ that he's given us, right? I see in the word of God where God has given us these truths, and they go beyond the generations, and that's what he's looking at us to be able to transfer over to the the next generation. That's what the call is. That's what the challenge is, right? 
And so we each and every one of us need to, to pick up that, that mantle and say, yes, God, I'm going to carry it and give it to the next generation, whatever that needs to look like. Now, I said I'm going to speak to the younger generation, but in actuality, right, in my prayer, I felt like the Lord said, no, you're going to speak to the older generation first. So here you go. I want to speak to the older generation, whatever you want to consider the older generation, right? You know, we grew up in a phrase that, that said, if you want something done, what? Do it yourself. There you go, right? Do it yourself. Because we were always taught that individual achievement, you know, the goal of individuality is, is the most important thing. And yet, when I study the kingdom of God, when I open up the word of God, it's not like a sport that's a solo sport, right? It's, it's not like a, 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 just a race with, you know, for yourself and you're racing with people. No, I see life as a, um, a relay race. That's how I see it. God's word is like a relay race. And we're to take the baton and we're to put it in the hands of the people that come next. We're to transfer that information. And if I were to ask you in a relay race, what's the most important part of that race? Do you know what you tell me? It's the passing of the baton. If you watch the Olympics, you see what I'm talking about, right? It's the passing of the baton. See, it doesn't matter how great you are. It doesn't matter how fast you are. It doesn't matter what you achieve. If you fail to pass the baton to the next generation, then you've lost the race. Do you see that? And so this idea of passing on what we have to the next generation is vitally important. Okay, I can't underscore that enough, how important that is. So I'm speaking to the older generation so that you will hear these words that God is expecting us as part of our journey in life to hand off the baton to the next generation. Now, how do we do that? Well, I believe that there are a couple of ways. First, we must love the next generation. I don't mean, you know, I don't, I don't mean just, you know, put up with them, Right. I mean, love them, be passionate for them, be their cheerleaders. And for an example, we have the uh, Apostle Paul, how he treated uh, Timothy, right? It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, and this isn't a blood son, this is a spiritual son, okay? My dear son, and so you're watching one generation to the next. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did. Why did I do that? Because Paul, Paul had his hand out, his ancestors put the baton in his hand, and he's running now, right? And he's getting ready to pass it off to Timothy. That's what's happening here. So, as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience, as night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers, right? I long, this is what Paul says now, I long to see you, Timothy, so that I may be filled with joy. And so what you're seeing is a passion, and if you read the Gospels, you see the passion of Paul pouring out for this young Timothy, right? And Timothy represents the next generation, guys. I re I'm reminded of your sincere faith, right? The sincere faith, I'll come back to that, which first lived in your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. I want to talk about this sincere faith because here's what I recognize there. Okay, what I recognize is as the older generation, when we're working with the younger generations, I don't think we should take it for granted that they know Jesus Christ, right? Even if they're in this church, even if they come to your small group, just because you're a part of a group doesn't mean that, uh, you know, a Christian group, that doesn't mean that you are a Christ follower. You've got to pursue to see if that thing is true, right? And so I think this is a, one of the clues that Paul's saying, he's saying a statement like that about Timothy, and he's saying, those of you that follow in my footsteps, you also need to be checking. That's what I see here. You know, I did a, um, a wedding not uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, it was of a young lady that I had known her since she was like three or four years old, right? And uh, she doesn't live here anymore, and she's in her 30s. And when she called Andy and I, to talk with us and to tell us she was engaged, she asked if we would do the premarital and if we would fly out at her expense to do the wedding. Well, I was thrilled to pieces. She found somebody that she really was in love with. And so I said, okay, well, why don't we have Zoom calls? And we'll do premarital that way. And then let's, let's see what happens, right? So we did. We did our uh, first Zoom meeting. And it took me all of two seconds to realize 
While she was a Christian, a Christ follower, he was not. Oof, right? He was not. I mean, he loved her, and he, he loved how she loved Christ and the value going to church and all that. So he was all over that, man. He was going to support her on, on her endeavors, right? So as he's talking, I found the conundrum because the word of God says, do not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever, right? Somebody who doesn't have the same faith as you. Why? Why? Why does it say that? It says that because your foundation can't be the same. It can't be firm, right? And so this is, an, this is a very important concept that God teaches in his word. And so I knew that. And in my heart, it just hurt because I love this young woman. So we prayed about it after meeting them. And uh, I felt like God said to continue in the counseling, but don't promise to marry them. So I was like, all right, Lord. So uh, in, in it, also in that prayer time, uh, Andy said, you know, because this guy's a very, uh, in, he's a big intellect, right? He said, why don't we make as part of the pre-marital, uh, you know, uh, coursework that we're going to give him, why don't we ask him to read uh, Lee Strobel's book, A Case for Christ, right? And so I thought, okay, that's different. <laughs> we can do this, right? So that's what we did. We assigned it. And as each week went by, we would talk about the book, but we'd also talk about some premarital things. And in there, I can see the young woman, her eyes are beginning to open up like, whoa, we are miles apart in our faith, right? And that was a real problem. She began to see that. So she was pressing in. Matter of fact, she called me to talk to me, right? Because she knew that, that part of my hesitation to fly out there was the fact that she was unequally yoked. And she knew that. And so she started praying also. Anyway, about, um, let's see, step five of that premarital course, right? We only had one left. Andy said to him, you know, because we'd been following the book, Andy said to him, well, you know, do you now believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And the young man, Chris, said, yes. He goes, I, I am now convinced that, that Jesus, you know, uh, is, is, is the Son of God. Yes, I can see that. You know, he goes, I get it. He did a good case. And so everything got quiet. And the Holy Spirit whispered to me, said, ask him, who does he say that I am? Who am I to him? And I thought, oof. So I asked him the question, who is Jesus Christ to you? And then he kind of looked at me and goes, what? And I go, I know you know him up here, but do you have him down here in a relational position? Is he the one that died for your sins on the cross? Is he not the one that sits at the right hand of the Father and intercedes for you? Is he not the leader of your life? And he was like, no. And I go, but you know, it's a choice. You can have that relationship if you want it, right? And no sooner did I say that, I could see everything going, shh. I could see, the, <laughs> I could see his fiance at the side going, oh, please, God, <laughs> right? Because she knew what was going on, right? Yeah, there's some of you here that you don't know Christ either. Father knows you're here. He knows you're watching, and he's calling you home. Okay, the story's for you. So that young man decided that yes, indeed, yes, indeed, he was going to go ahead. And he said, I want that. He goes, but I don't know how to do that. I said, well, we're going to lead you in a prayer. And we did. And he accepted Christ as a Savior. Now, I know it took, here's why, because he's going to church, right? Not only that, he's, he's leading in church, and he's pursuing things of the Lord. He's reading the Word of God right? He's, he's opening up. What does this mean? Guys, especially older generation, when we get young people that come into our, our sphere of influence, right? We need to understand that not everybody that walks into the church or in your group or whatever has a relationship with Jesus Christ, right? And so we need to help to check in to make sure in a prayer it seems like such an easy thing, to, but this is so profound. It's got a mystery to its own that when we lead them, things happen, right? And so we need to be like the Apostle Paul. We need to be sure, like he was with Timothy, when we start to mentor young people. Now, what I also want to show you is that there were building blocks that were in play here that Paul talks about, you know, in the scriptures with Timothy, and they were all about helping young Timothy uh, discover who he was. You've seen that with the grandmother and the mother and a lot of other people that were speaking into Timothy's life, right? He, they were showing him how to find his shape. And shape is an acronym 
it's the, the word itself stands for things. The S stands for their spiritual gifts, right? The H stands for the heart or the passion that God's placed inside of you. The A is your abilities. You know, those God-given abilities you have. The P is the personality that God's given you, right? In other words, if you're an introvert, you're not supposed to be an extrovert. You're supposed to understand who God has made you. And then the E is for the experiences that he gives you, right? The good and the bad, they all contribute and they all contribute to who we are, our shape, who we're supposed to be. And that shape then begins to notify you as to your purpose. Well, the Apostle Paul knew this. He knew this, and he wanted to make sure that Timothy followed this, right? And so let me see. For this reason, I remind you to fan, fan into flame. And this is talking about, right, fan into flame the gifts of God. That means your shape. Okay, that means your shape which is in you through the laying on of hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, right? I'm going to stop here for a minute. Does not make you timid. You know, so many of us, we, when we start to realize our shape, the things we were afraid to do, we no longer get afraid to do, right? All of a sudden, we, are, we take on like another, another platform. I mean, we're just able to go to places we never thought, dreamed, or imagined we'd ever be, Right? See, fear wants to hold us down, but the Spirit of God, what he wants to do is to give us power, give us love and of a se- you know, self-discipline, being able to, to follow after what God says. This is the importance of knowing your shape. This is the importance of learning to connect it to your purpose. Guys, this is an important element of us working with young people, right? Uh, as a mentor, you want to point out God-given shapes to people. They need to get this. They need to understand the God-given shape. Now, this is so important that we have a whole class called Growth Track 2 that we talk about who has God made you to be. We want you to discover that. Why? Because I don't think you can really understand where God wants you to go until you understand what he's done here, right? And so you need to understand that. If you've not taken those classes, then you need to get yourself in there. That's your next step, right? You need to understand your shape. And those of us of the older generation, our job is to run alongside the young people and to help them not just to discover their shape, but how do you employ it, right? How do you use it? That's our good pleasure that we are going to run alongside of them and help them to do that. And the way we're going to do that is the second part. We're going to let them share in our lives. We're going to let them share in our lives, right? The older generation, we need to be able to share our lives with them, not just our faith, but our lives. This is very important. We see this in the Apostle Paul. But as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you have learned it. In other words, Timothy, you've been running with me, Paul, for a long dang time, right? And we know that the Apostle Paul says he's the chief of sinners. We tend not to think about that, right? Because we know him as the apostle that wrote all the letters. But really, he talks about himself. He talks about all his issues that he has, his uh, discrimination issues. I mean, he's got all these kinds of issues that he's working out with God. And Timothy's got a front row seat for them, right? And it's impacted him in such a mighty way that we see that he's able to take him and to walk forward and become a strong leader. Guys, one of the things I want to say is that we need to have this authentic ability uh, to live out who we are before the young people that we bring in to mentor in our lives, okay? We need to be authentic as to who we are and where we're at, the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? You know, I was thinking as a young woman, when I uh, first entered into the vineyard movement, right, I, uh, I started and I joined because they were meeting at a beach, <laughs> right? That's where the vineyard in this area started, was on the beach, down at the north end of Virginia Beach. And I was like, oh, yeah, man, sign me up, right? And we were there, and then we just grew. And so they brought in, the elders brought in a pastor. His name is Mark Foreman. And so he helped to pastor us. And I was a young woman at the time, and so he was mentoring me. I met uh, Pastor Andy, and actually Mark married Andy and I, and he did our premarital counseling. And, And so we were very close. And it wasn't just Mark. He invited us into his life, so I knew his wife and his kids, right? And one of the things I loved about Mark when I remember him is he had this ability to love Jesus like I've never seen, right? 
And he would write love songs to Jesus. Matter of fact, a lot of the ones we sing today, the old school ones, are ones that he wrote, right? Very, very powerful man. Anyway, I can remember the day when our, um, our uh, heads of our movement came in, right, to our little church. There was only about 200 of us at the time. And they came in, and uh, they actually removed Mark from leadership, moved him from his pastoring. And they did that because Mark had had an affair earlier in his career uh, as a pastor, right? Now, guys, I can tell you that I had a front row seat to that thing. I watched the devastation in his family because Mark hid nothing from us. He invited us to come over. I watched his wife cry and his kids be impacted. I watched the church leadership start to fall apart. Our little movement was disintegrating, right? All that, all that chaos, and I was sitting right in the middle, and Pastor Andy and I, we would go home, and we'd be praying and pouring out our heart before God. We'd be talking about, you know, what we learned, right? And not only that, we began to realize that this thing called integrity was huge, was huge, right? And I tell you, we've been in ministry over 30 years, and that I don't think we've had a, a moment where integrity wasn't the center of our ministry, because we've seen firsthand the devastation. And so if you ask me, while Mark, Mark had to fall, right? He's back in ministry, by the way, because he got restored. He repented, Amen. right? But here's the thing I want you to know. Because I had a front row seat, it impacted us. It impacted me, right? They didn't try to whitewash it. I saw all that I saw, and it impacted me. Guys of the older generation, when you bring somebody in, don't feel like your life's got to be all buttoned up and clean and nice, right? Let them see the struggles. Let them, let them feel the pain that you feel. That's a blessing that you give to young people, right? And so I want you to know that a principle, and walk away with this principle, that mentorship, mentorship needs an open and authentic backdrop to it. We need to give that to the young people. Now, I said that I was going to talk to the young people, but I needed to talk to the older generation first, right? This is important that we are able to communicate to them because it is incumbent upon us. We have that baton. You have got to successfully plant it in the hearts of those that you would be mentoring, okay? That's a call out to you. That's what the Spirit of God has been calling me to make sure I say to you. So what do I want to say to the younger leaders? Oh, my goodness. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share some, some wisdom with you. But before I get there, let me just say, it's hard. It is hard for an older generation person to talk to the new generation. It just is. Like, here's a great example. I had a young person text me. That's how they talk. They text me, and they said, uh, let me see if I can do it. OMG, it is lit, L-I-T. I'm like, what the heck? I had to go find one of my young adult sons and say, can you read this? What does this mean, <laughs> right? You know, and they were just like, well, mom, it means that, oh, my God, they're having a fantastic time, a great, exciting time. I was like, oh, okay, right? I didn't know what that meant. And then here you go. There was another time, another young woman who I was working with, she sent me you, and then she put in you ghosting. And I'm thinking, What? What does that mean? And again, going to one of the young people that, that I work with, I said, what is this? And they go, it means that you just didn't return their, their text, right? I said, yeah. Said, How many times they text you? I said, I don't know. I'm busy, <laughs> right? I've got a lot going on. I'm busy. And they're like, well, they're concerned about the relationship because you're not texting them back, right? And I'm like, oh, I get it. And then my favorite mess up of all times is one of my young men that I mentor right? He was, walking down the, he was walking down the hallway, and we had a meeting later, and I looked down, and I said, hey, I cannot wait to hook up with you today. Oh, you got it. Yeah. And if you didn't get it, you need to go look it up on Google, right? Because hookup does not mean what it did in my generation, okay? Guys, young people, I'm making fun of myself, but I'm telling you, it's hard. It's hard, so give us a little grace, Okay? Give us a little grace. We're, we're working on it. We're working on it. We're just a little slower, right? But the heart is there. 
and we want to connect with young people. We really do. You just have to help bridge the gap, okay? So young ones, here you go. The first thing I want to tell a young leader is to find a mentor. It's not a suggestion. It's really what you need to do, right? It's like so important. Everything you read about in the Word of God talks about mentorship as passing the baton, right? Like you could go back even in the Old Testament, you know, you see Eli with, with Samuel, you know. You, you, you look at Moses and, and he's got Jacob. I mean, you keep looking back and you can see it. And even coming forward, we see Barnabas with Paul and we looked at Paul with Timothy. It is the way it was done in the Bible, right? And so it's supposed to be done that way now. But yet when I watch and I work with young people, one of the ways they get their hunger and their need fed right, for being mentored, is their favorite things are to go to podcasts or to, to go to a video or to go to social media, right, and, and, or even audio books. And all those things are good if we're just transferring information, right? Those are good for transferring information. But if you want life transformation, if you want life shaping, you need to be in relationship. You need to be, now listen, in relationship with somebody because that's where that thing happens, doesn't happen over a podcast. It happens when you come in relationship. You see, mentoring was always meant to be a personal exchange, a relational exchange, where one who's an older generation gives of their resources to the younger generations. So what are we talking about the resources? I'm talking about wisdom. I'm talking about accountability, right? I'm talking about knowledge. I'm talking about experience. That's what we give. And we do it relationally, going back and forth. So this whole idea of finding a mentorship, you know, somebody to mentor you, it's not a, just a, a one-off, hey, this would be good if you do. No, your life depends on it. You need that. Now, on, during the years that you will live, you will have many mentors, many mentors if you have eyes to see, okay? Now, for me, when I was back in graduate school, a lot younger, right, I'm, I can still remember to this day uh, two people that impacted me greatly when I was in school, right? There was this one gal. She just came out. She just earned her doctor degree. And so she came in, and she was working at the master's level to teach us. Uh, and I was in the school of education. <clears throat> she so intrigued me. She loved the Lord, but she had been uh, fostering this diagnostic and prescriptive way of thinking in education, and it just intrigued me. I, I just was, I could just listen to her like a sponge in her class, just soaking it all up. I couldn't get enough. Matter of fact, I found myself raising my hand. Please, can I come to your office? I'll help you arrange the books on your shelf. I'll help you grade your papers if you like. Let me carry your suitcase or, you know, your briefcase, right? I even volunteered at her house to cut the grass and wash the dishes. Why? So I could be by her just to listen to her. She was training my brain to think differently. And then her name is Dr. Sebnowski. And then I met another uh, professor, right, at this particular school. And uh, he came on the scene. His name is Dr. Alan Arroyo. Well, he came in and he began to show me that the things I was learning, that if I put them in my shape, he didn't have that word shape down. He said, but if I take them in myself and use them, they become my ministry. So now he's helping to shape my worldview, right? He's helping me to shape my worldview. And I tell you, he actually got me to look into my life. And you see, I am one who is learning disabled. And I struggled. I hated school. <laughs> I mean, I hated it, right? Yet I knew God was calling me to go and make changes there. And so I had that technical expertise. And Dr. Royal, what he taught me is to put it in with my shape, my passion, my experience, right? What I had experienced, you know, those abilities. He said, take them all. And if you use them, Sharon, they don't just transform kids' lives. They transform the whole family unit who has been damaged by education, right? Huge Huge changes in my mind and the way I thought. Matter of fact, in grabbing hold of this and running with this baton that they passed me, do you know they asked, asked me to come and to be an adjunct professor there to teach teachers and administrators, right? I used to laugh. I'd leave my class and go, <laughs> the ones that are not thriving, the learning disabled, here I am one who's teaching them now. I mean, go, go figure, right? 
Go figure. But that's what God does. When we begin to understand our shape and we put it with the skills that God brings us into and mentors, right, we're able to do so much more than we think. And I tell you, I have not been in a classroom. I've not been in the educational system for a long time. But I tell you, I can stand up here today and I can tell you the formation of my mind and what he taught me, right, what Dr. Arroyo taught me internally, I've taken and I've laid the foundation in this church and it's everywhere. So those mentors, they're everywhere. They're upon all of you guys. Not only you guys, when God asked Andy and I to help uh, to lead our region, which is a lot of states and pastors, do you know what I use when I teach them? The way Dr. Stabnowski showed me how to do diagnostic and prescriptive procedures and being able to answer crises and things that happen in our life and to be able to use one's uh, shape to be able to attack that difficulty that they were facing. Guys, it just keeps going on and on. We are who we choose to be with. And mentors are presented all around you. And young people, I want you to open up your eyes for they are so close to you, you wouldn't even, you wouldn't even imagine, right? They're all around you. And a podcast, your own generation just isn't enough. You need the older generation. You need them to come alongside you so they can call out the very best in you, all right? And so I want to encourage you to find this mentor. Matter of fact, I put a challenge down there just like I did for the older generation. Who are you going to mentor? I'm asking you who's going to be your mentor, young people. I want you to think about this. If you don't have a name, you got somebody that's not mentoring you yet, what I want you to do is I want you to start to pray. And there's something called the Holy Spirit, which is God's presence inside us. Say, Holy Spirit, come. Open my eyes so I can see who would, who would be somebody that you would have me, you know, to learn from, right? From this season. And then just to start to work with, with the leadership. This is remembering. Just remember to work with the leadership and start to watch. It'll rise up. It'll rise, and you go, oh. And, and you don't have to scare the older generation by going, come and saying, will you be my mentor? That's, like, terrifying, right? That, that, that's scary for older folks, most older folks that I mean, right, the next, the older generation. What you need to do is you need to come and go, need your grass cut? Need your book rearranged, your bookshelf, right? Hey, here you go. This is a biggie. You want me to help you to figure out how to clean out your computer, <laughs> Right? Right. And so come alongside of them and run with them. This is going to be important. You see, we want to fulfill the scripture in Hebrews where it says, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life. And here you go. And imitate. Imitate their faith. Right? Not all the, their political or whatever stances, but their faith. You want to be able to do that and to walk in that. All right. The next one I want to talk to you about Oh, uh, I'd say to young people is don't give up. Don't give up. You know, doing this gig of being a pastor, I meet thousands of people. They come through here, you know, at a, at a very fast rate. And, and one of the things I've noticed is they'll come in and they love the church. This is great. And I see them everywhere for about six months. Then about a year into it, they're gone. And I don't even know where they are anymore, right? They're just gone. And so I have really come to appreciate this stick to you know, even when you don't understand something or something gets hard that you stick to it. And so this whole idea of not running away is important, that you just don't quit. You see, at the base of quitting is this idea, is this idea that says that whatever the experience, it didn't meet your expectation. And that could be in marriage, that could be in mentorship, that could be in a church, that could be in a ministry, right? It didn't meet your expectation. There's some of us that are Christ followers. We go into a situation. Now listen, because I know this is the Lord. We go into a situation. We say, if this is you, God, then this is what it's going to look like. Right? I'm, if this is you, this is what it's going to look like. My life is going to be happy. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have financial freedom. And, and people are going to appreciate me. Right? And, 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 and I'm going to spiritually grow. And so, and so you have all these, if this is really God, these things are going to happen. But you know what? It doesn't work out that way because life is hard. Amen. Life is hard, right? And we need to understand that life is hard. It comes rushing at us and it brings the unexpected. And so we need to know that. That's what Apostle 
uh, Paul said to Timothy, Timothy, my son, I'm, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies, which was his calling, his shape, once made about you, so that you, by recalling them, right, by remembering them, you will fight the good fight, the good battle. You won't quit. That's what he's saying, so you won't quit. So it's important to understand that. You see, I talk to too many people that are going to quit. They're going to quit their marriage or they're going to quit school. They're going to quit a job or they're going to quit a relationship, right? And they're going to quit because the expectation isn't there. And it's like this presupposition that exists underneath, right? It's all, it's all about, well, gosh, Lord, you can't be in this because it's hard, like somehow we have bought in in the 21st century that life is about easy street. It's about not having pain. But I'm going to tell you when I read the Bible, when I open it up from the beginning to the end, it's all about life is hard. And it's about what do we do as believers. How do we respond to it? But life is hard. And we need to recognize that, right? So when I talk to people and they say, you know, I'm going to quit because this or that, you know, like somehow their pain is abnormal. But I want to tell you, it's normal when people disagree with you. It is normal when somebody says, you can count on me, and then they walk out, right? It's normal when you don't have enough money to buy everything you want. It's normal when family relationships break down. You know, it's normal when you get frustrated. These are not abnormal. These are normal. It's called living in life. And life can be so painful. And you need to understand that. But here you go. This is what Jesus tells us. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Right? In the midst of those difficult places. In this world you will have trouble. Right? But take heart. For I have overcome the world. And so what I need you to realize, especially you young people... Don't quit. When you get knocked down and you hit that canvas, you just pop right back up. All right? You don't quit. You don't quit because life is very hard. You know, as a young person, I learned that the movement, this movement called Vineyard, it was founded by somebody called John Wimber, right? And he used to have this saying that says, uh, don't doubt in the darkness what you heard in the light, right? Don't doubt in the darkness what you heard in the light. You see, he knew that there would be dark times that come upon us. And when God has talked to you in the light, he's given you a promise. He's given you a mission. He's given you a calling. Even if it gets dark, don't doubt him. He'll make it come to be. You just have to lean not on your own understanding, but on his. And it will happen. It will happen as he says so. So does that mean we're not supposed to check in when it gets hard? No. You check in with the Lord, but you don't quit. You bounce back up. Now, third thing I want to talk to young people about is don't do anything stupid, right? <laughs> foolish. That's a nice word, foolish. But it really is don't be stupid, right? Because so many, especially young people, you fall and you do things that are not wise. And so I want to encourage you to be careful with that. It says, this is what the Apostle Paul said, holding on to faith, right? And faith, guys, is believing, right, is believing what has not yet been seen. It's believing and hoping in Christ, even though you haven't seen it yet. So that's what faith is. Holding on to faith and a good conscience. Conscience is the inner voice that speaks to us, right? Which some have rejected, because he's saying he's noticing it. Some have rejected, and so have what? Suffered shipwreck of their faith. And so we're seeing this, you know, in regards to their faith. And so what we're seeing is that it's easy to get confused and lost out there, to do dumb things, right? Matter of fact, the Apostle Paul is telling Timothy, he's actually bringing up two of their colleagues, right, who decided to step away from the teaching and to instead change the narrative of what God was saying to fit their narrative so they could do the behaviors they wanted to do. But here's the thing I know. Here's the thing I know. God has given us, uh, I see this, a picture here. God has given us this conscience, right? And it's almost like a boat that sits here. And it's your conscience. It's knowing right and wrong. And then and he's talking to you through your conscience. And he takes your faith and he puts it right there in your conscience, right? And if you punch holes in your conscience, guess what happens to your faith? It falls out, right? It falls. What I'm connecting here is your behavior 
and your belief. Your behavior in life and your belief in God, they are linked together. And so you need to understand that. You need to understand that if you neglect your conscience and to listen to it, right? What you do is you, you just take steps away from God. You start to walk backwards away from God. And all of a sudden you're like, where's God at? Where's God? Because you're ignoring your conscience. And then if you abuse your conscience, right? And you do things you know that aren't right. And you choose that. You keep getting further away. So much so that you wonder where your faith is. And you don't know where it's at anymore. And you feel so far away from the Lord. Listen, when I have found that I have done that, I don't walk. I run back to where I knew God was. I run back. Young people, you run back when that happens to you. You don't stay back there. You run back, right? Father is waiting for you. He's calling you to come home. He's calling you to be a part of, of recognizing that your behaviors are linked in with the way you believe. They go hand in hand. And so there'll be some that would say, yeah, but when I read the word of God, it's not, it's not palatable, Sharon. They say things and, and my generation just rejects them. Okay, so are you deciding what's truth and what's not in God's word? Are you deciding that? No, 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 we don't. There's many things in the Bible I don't get, right? I don't understand. But yet if I sit with the Father, he brings wisdom as I trust him to understand. So you don't pick and choose the word of God and say, I will believe this and I will not believe this. I'll do this and I won't do that, right? Like he says, don't have sex outside of out of, out of being married, you know? And a lot of times I talk to young people and go, oh, but we're so in love, right? And we're the exception. No, you're not. You're not the exception. God is the, he's given us the owner manual so that we know how to behave in life. Why? Because he knows what's best for us. Listen, what I just described happens 100,000 times, young people. And so you have to learn to just trust and lean into God, even though you don't understand him, instead of trying to make it all make sense with oneself, right? And your mentors around you will help you in that process. Trust them. Trust them and see what you will, you'll be able to, to rise above and be successful in the life you want to lead. Now, I have talked a thousand one words to you today. I know that. And I did feel like when I was praying that the Lord said, talk to the older generation. You see, as I speak, I know that a lot of you are going, she doesn't know how busy I am, <laughs> right? I got kids. I, I got grandkids. I got, I got my job. I'm on the ladder of success. But I'm here to do a wake-up call with you, older generation. It don't matter because you're not in an individual race. It matters if you take that baton and you pass it to the next generation. And it doesn't have to be just your blood people, right? Your kids or your grandkids. It's spiritually also. And this church has a lot of young people because that's how God has designed us. Find one. Start to ask the Holy Spirit. He'll give it to you. You know, you need that. You need that. You need that. They need you. They need you. They cannot run successfully without you. They're hampered. Oh my goodness, God is pressing on this point so hard. And it's because when we get old, we get fixed in our ways, isn't it, Father? And we refuse to move. And you are saying, move. Move because you will not win this race of faith successfully if you do not pass it to the next generation. Now, young people, you have to have a mentor it can't be about older folks finding you. You've got to desire it deep down in your heart and run with it all your might. Go look for it, right? If you can't find it, come and talk to me. I will pray for you, right, to make sure that you have that in your life. And listen, once you start your, your faith walk and your journey, don't give up. Don't give up because he has for you such things that you cannot hope, dream, or imagine. You're important to him. He sees where you are, and he loves who you have become and who you will become. You just have to trust him and walk with him, right? Walk with him. Push away from your culture that would say, let's set, you know, truth to, uh, to just being relative. No, the word of God is not relative. It is fixed. And so that is your anchor. That's the anchor that you need to have. 
Now, God has given us a challenge today. I have given you a challenge. If you missed it, let me tell you again. Older people, you're supposed to be mentoring people. Younger people, you're supposed to have a mentor. You're supposed to find one. That's what the Holy Spirit has been saying. That's what he's challenging our church. And I hope you take him up on that. He'll show you how to walk those next steps. Bow your heads with me. Hmm. Hmm. Yes, Father. I heard that. You have said that you have desired. Father says that he has desired to turn the hearts of the, I see the hearts of the father back to the children. The hearts of the mothers and the fathers back to the children. Not just blood children, but spiritual children. That's his desire. That's his call today. That's what the Spirit of God has been saying. And God has also been calling to those of you that have been disobedient. Those of you that have decided to do it your way. God is calling you back. He says, I want to give you wisdom so that you can choose righteousness. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you confront us, that you call us to a different level, Lord God. And so I ask, Father, that these seeds that we have planted today, they would take root in the heart and in the minds of your, your people, Lord. I see that. And that, yes, God says, if you allow that to plant down, he'll grow it up to be like a mighty tree, and many will come and rest in your branches. And Father, I thank you for this generation, this younger generation. I ask, Lord Jesus, that you would give them all the power and authority that they need to walk and to uh, proclaim you as Christ Jesus amongst all people, Lord. Would you do in their generation so much more than you did in mine, Lord? And let me be faithful, Father, to pass them, to pass them this torch, Lord, to pass them this, this, uh, this baton. I thank you, Lord. I see that. It's always been about our choice, isn't it? And so, Lord, help us. Holy Spirit, empower us to do that. Now you've spoken one more thing in my heart. You said that there are people that are here and that are watching online. And you're far from God. You're like that little story I was telling in the beginning about the guy that was dating the girl that was a Christian. Only you're not. You know who Jesus Christ is in your head. You know who he is. But he's not Lord of your life. And so when the question comes, who do you say that he is, you waver. And so Father has told me that he is calling all those that are far to come home, not to condemn you, but to love you. Not, not to cast you out, but to give you purpose in your life, to give you a firm foundation to stand on for the things that he has for you. And so I'm going to ask you to do something um, that, that can be counterintuitive, can be scary, right? I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you're in my audience to let me know that you're going to pray with me. And for those online, I want you to hit a button that says, uh, I raise my hand. The reason we do this while every head is bowed and every eye is closed is because we have to uh, answer the cry of the Spirit. And the Spirit cries out. Yeah, I hear it. The Spirit cries out, I am far and I desire to come in. And so just shoot your hand up right now. It's between you and the Lord. But this is a, a significant thing. Yeah, I see. I see them. All right, you can put them down now. Listen, I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Just say, right where you're at, it's between you and the Lord. Just say, Father God, I want to come home. I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I ask him to be the leader of my life. And the best way I understand, I ask Holy Spirit to come live inside of me. I give you my life. Now, I'm going to pray for you. Father, those that were praying that prayer, I thank you that you seal it in their heart, that not only did you write their name in the book of life, Lord, but that you are empowering them, Father, to be so much more than they ever thought they could. And so, Holy Spirit, just go and be with them now. And, Father, I thank you for all the things that you taught us today. Lord, let it not, not produce uh, just, I hear that, not produce just 10, but share and ask for more. So I ask that it would produce a hundredfold. No, I ask for a thousandfold, Lord. 
I ask for a thousandfold because you asked me to ask that. You desire to use the people here because they're fertile, aren't they? They're well-equipped. Father says you're well-equipped for the journey. So Holy Spirit, I ask that you would help them to see that, that they would find their footing in you. And Father, overtake this church. Cause it to rise up and to answer what you said, that we were to be an, uh, yeah, an intergenerational church, Lord God. And we will give you the honor and glory in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, guys. Well, we're getting ready for a transition right now. For those of you that gave your life to Christ when we were praying, right? You prayed with me. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to tell somebody. You can uh, tell me by filling out the tab and putting it there and then putting it in the box when you leave. People online that you hit that. I want you to know that you could also instant message us and we'll help you. Your next step is to tell somebody of the decision you made, right? And if you're in my audience and you've not taken Growth Track, listen, Growth Track 2 it's, is a great place to jump in, right? It helps you to understand your shape. You can't teach people their shape if you do not understand how it works, right? Who you are. And so I encourage you to uh, join me in that class. And for those of you that want to continue worshiping Jesus, right? This is your church family. You want to continue to worship Jesus in your tithes and offerings. Well, on the screens are coming up now different ways that you can give this ministry to this ministry, right? To do that. So while you're taking note of that, let me also tell you that since the pandemic, we this past uh, September, right? Beginning or the end of August, we have been able to open back up and take and receive interns from the different school systems. They're starting to come back in now, right? And these are young people from all walks of life. They're studying all kinds of things. And we give them a platform, not just to practice what they're learning, their trade, but it's here that we can have that personal mentorship where you can sit and you can talk to them, right? And we can do that because of your support. We can impact mightily because of what you do. So stand on up. Stand on up with me. We're going to go back into one more song, and then we're going to dismiss you. But let me just speak one more blessing before I leave you today. Holy Spirit, start on this side of the room, and I ask that you'd run across the room. I ask, Father, that the seeds that are planted, that you begin to water, even now as we worship, Lord, water them so that that plant can take hold. In Jesus' name, amen.